In this following video, I'd like to share with you what are the principles in the management of a patient with an anterior lenticonus. What's most interesting, I find, is looking at and understanding what are the visual implications of an anterior lenticonus. Let's now take a closer look at the clinical presentation of an anterior lenticonus and look even more closely at what are the visual phenomena that the patient experiences as a result of the same. Let's start with the clinical presentation. When you look at the anterior lens surface of a patient with the anterior lenticonus, you'll actually find a conical projection of the central anterior capsule in the pupillary plane. This is classic and pathognomonic of an anterior lenticonus. Retroillumination reveals the classic oil goblet appearance, which is seen in the center of the nucleus as a result of the anterior lenticonus. The patient had a visual acuity of 6 by 18 in both eyes, and the refractive error in his right eye was a myopia of minus 20 diopters with a cylinder of minus 2 at 180, and in the left eye was a myopia of minus 21 diopters with a cylinder of minus 3 at 180 degrees. Let's now look at the ray tracing aberrometry to evaluate what are the effects of an anterior lenticonus on the patient's quality of vision. The Tracy refraction shows a myopia of minus 14.25 diopters with a cylinder of minus 5.37 diopters at 177 degrees. When we look at the change in the refraction with respect to the size of the pupil, now you will see that at a 2 mm pupil that we have a myopia of minus 24.22 diopters with a cylinder of minus 10.7 at 173 degrees which at 3 mm goes down to minus 19 diopters with a reduction in the cylinder to minus 7.84 at the same axis. At 5 mm the myopia goes down further to minus 9.54 and a further reduction in the cylinder and if you were to compare the refraction at 6.5 mm pupil size now you're left with just a mere myopia of minus 4.27 diopters with a cylinder of as little as minus 2.81 diopters at 179 degrees. This denotes that the very high induced myopia occurs as a result of the protrusion of the anterior lens capsule and the lens in the center at the pupillary area and with the progressive dilatation of the pupil, now the light rays are passing through the more flatter anterior lens capsule with a reduced amount of curvature myopia induced by the anterior lens surface. Next, I'd like you to note that the patient's refractive cylinder is minus 5.37 diopters at 177 degrees whereas the corneal cylinder is a mere 1.32 diopters at 99 degrees. This signifies that a large amount of the refractive cylinder is contributed to by the lens. And finally on this slide I'd like you to note that the induced spherical aberration is minus 4.266 microns. And if you were to look at the Chang analysis, it shows you that most of the symptoms are as a result of issues in the internal optics that is in the lens. The dark blue line indicates the presence of a significant spherical aberration. This is a common finding which is fairly characteristic of an anterior lenticonus. Now spherical aberrations are known to cause glare, halos and night myopia. You will also notice the presence of significant coma in the internal optics, that is the lens. Now the presence of coma generally denotes either the lens is decentered or tilted. It's important to remember that coma is often the cause of blur and double vision. The internal modular transfer function reveals a huge drop in the overall MTF. In this patient with a very early nucleosclerosis, the, the intense drop in the MTF is possibly the resultant of the anterior lenticonus itself. Let's now look at the dysfunctional lens index. What is the dysfunctional lens index? 
It is an objective matrix that actually measures how much of the visual symptoms of the patient are being contributed to by the lens. A high DLI therefore indicates that the lens is not responsible for the patient's symptoms. Lower the DLI signifies that the lens is contributing to a large amount of the patient's symptoms. In this case, you can see that the DLI is down to 0.19, signifying that a large part of the patient's symptoms are caused by the lens itself. Now, we do know that the patient hardly has a cataract. Therefore, it's important to understand that an anterior lenticornis is going to be responsible for visually disabling symptoms even without an underlying cataract. If you were to look at the simulated E in the internal optics, see how distorted is the letter E that the patient is going to see. And finally, a quick recap of what the patient is going to see. He's got glare, he's got halo, blur, double vision, and night hyperopia. Now this patient with anterior lenticonus had a very, very soft cataract. The plan was to perform a phacoemulsification with the implantation of a monofocal IOL in the capsular bag. Let's watch the surgery. Notice the central oil globular reflex induced by the anterior lenticonus. We start with the incisions. In an attempt to combat the corneal astigmatism, an opposing clear corneal incision is made at about 80 degrees. This is followed by the staining of the anterior capsule. Viscoelastic is introduced into the anterior chamber prior to performing the capsular excess. What's different in these cases is that central protrusion in the lens. So whilst handling the instruments in and out of the eye while staining with blue dye or while viscoinsufflating of the anterior chamber, we should make sure that the tip of those instruments do not damage the anterior capsule. It's also sometimes challenging to initiate the rexes in an anterior lenticonus. Once it's brought out into the normal lens, it's quite easy and it remains like a regular capsular rexes. This is what you'll see in this part of the video. Because of an inability to proceed with the cystotome, the surgeon had to resort to the use of an intraocular forceps in order to complete the capsular rexes. You will now notice a small tendency of the capsule to run out towards the periphery. And see how the surgeon merely re-grasps the anterior capsule and pulls it slightly inwards, steering it back into its course and ending up completing the rexus successfully. This is followed by the hydrodissection in this virtually non-existent cataract. Now, since this lens is so soft, I chose to remove it with the bimanual irrigation aspiration itself. This is what you'll see in this part of the video. The alternative technique 
would have been to hydroprolapse it like I did and go with the phaco probe and just aspirate it in irrigation aspiration itself without going into the phaco mode ever. Having completed the aspiration of the nucleus, I now proceed to the bimanual irrigation aspiration and finally the introduction of the monofocal IOL in the capsular bag, the visco wash and the stromal hydration. Towards the end of the case, you can see a well-centered monofocal IOL in the capsular bag. The patient did very well post-operatively. He had a visual acuity of 6x6 with a cylinder of minus half at 90. This brings me to the end of the discussion of this patient with anterior lenticulinus. I hope you found it useful. Thank you.